if you say anything about guns, they say, oh, you ought to be like America and have school shootings. And it's like, only if I was in high school with you, my friend. <laughs> then Andrew's dodging the media and his wife not dodging pedestrians in her s <laughs> Five minutes is like foreplay. You don't drop into anything meaningful unless you stay with the conversation. You think these people are suddenly going to go, oh yeah, we forgot about individual liberty. <laughs> but I said, no way, Fox News agrees with you that we should support <laughs> Al-Qaeda in Syria. Hi, it's nice to meet you, Randall's seven subscribers. Mom, that's you. <laughs> and all six of your other accounts. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Deactivist Show. We're here with David Limbrick. How are you going, David? Great. How are you, Randall? I'm pretty well, pretty well. Uh, it's always hard teeing up a live stream when someone's in Melbourne because of the time zone. So it's 3 p.m. here, but you guys are stuck in 1945. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's still 3 p.m. here, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so just for uh, about 50% of our viewership are overseas. So just for them, just tell us who you are and how you fit into Melbourne. So they'll know Melbourne as being one of the most locked down cities in the world. So where do you fit in that picture? Yeah, so um, I'm uh, David Limbrick. I'm a member of parliament in the upper house in uh, Victorian state parliament. So that's sort of like a state senate, I suppose. Um, I'm from a minor party. Our, our Parties called the Liberal Democrats. Um, if any Americans are watching, they'll probably screw their nose up at that. But effectively, we're a libertarian party. And um, uh, I was elected along with a colleague, uh, Tim Quilty. So there's two of us in the upper house in Victoria uh, back in 2018. And um, I think um, <clears throat> when we first got elected, uh, you know, we were pretty low profile, I suppose, uh, in many ways. And when we first did an interview back in 2019, I think um, the issues that were of concern to many people were quite different to what they are now. And what happened during the pandemic, um, when that started, uh, we became sort of one of the leading voices in speaking out against what we saw were some of the disproportionate uh, responses by the government, some of the uh, some of the uh, encroachments on individual liberty that happened during the pandemic. And we fought back against uh, many of these things throughout the pandemic and thus got a huge explosion in um, you know, media coverage, social media following, uh, party membership and all this sort of thing. So we had a huge growth curve during the pandemic. And I, I, I said to a couple of people, it was really weird. We went into the pandemic and we went into this lockdown and um, you know, lots of people uh, couldn't work or they had to work from home and we just continued working doing stuff you know um, as much as we could in fact I was working more than I've ever worked in my entire life during the lockdowns and when we went into the lockdown we were sort of fairly unknown and when we came out we were sort of like you know um, small-scale celebrities uh, without sort of realizing it and it's I'm still sort of getting used to that but um yeah, that's sort yeah, of how like when the, when the Beatles came back from overseas and they were like, what, we're famous now? Yeah, yeah, I'm still getting used to the idea of people stopping me in the street and stuff for selfies and things like that. But um, yeah, look, I think uh, I've said this many times that people who appreciate liberty the most are those who've lost it. And um, many, you know, everyone to some degree has lost their liberty. They are looking around and saying, well, who's defending it? And it was us. So um, that's sort of uh, what happened over the last few years. So we're sort of just coming out of that now and not, not out of it yet, but um, certainly things aren't as dire as they were in the last couple of years. Um, you know, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to work now. And, um, but we're still in a state of emergency. We're still, um, uh, yeah, we're still operating under emergency powers. We have been for over two years now, which is, you know, unacceptable. But I'm sort of hopeful that they'll that will end fairly soon. One of the things I wanted to ask you is that you've put forward so many motions, but uh, let me get the specific one. I think motion six two eight. Uh, you're asking for um, 
them to show their documents about whether they were um, violating human rights or or the, the the risk benefit rate, all of this kind of stuff that justified their um, response to the pandemic. Uh, what happened with that? Yeah, so um, this one of the big concerns under so previously we had this. Uh, uh, state of emergency, so these uh, emergency powers. And the government in in Victoria, or in Victoria we have what's called a, a human rights charter, so a charter of human rights and responsibilities. And this is meant to protect things like, to some degree, like uh, freedom of movement, freedom of association, um, you know, right to work, uh, freedom from uh, non-consensual medical procedures, all of these things are contained in the charter. And, you know, I've got problems with the charter, but generally I think it's it was a good thing. Um, I thought that before the pandemic. And one of the things that the government needed to do when they come up with these restrictions is uh, say, how does these uh, restrictions that were placing on the population, how do they restrict people's rights and how are they justified? Now, my understanding is that they actually did that but they didn't release any of that stuff. So we put through a doc, what they call a documents motion in parliament, it passed parliament, and um, we wanted them to release the human rights charter assessments. That's the, that's the, you know, the, the calculations that they do against why they're restricting people's rights and also the underlying um, medical advice, which informed those decisions. Now, you know, to my mind, that should have been done uh, as part of the course, right? But it wasn't. I think that the reason that they didn't want to release it is they were concerned about the legal repercussions, like people might challenge it in court. There was a few court challenges on, on various things. And so they um, basically stated in that, the response to that, oh, it's a lot of documentation. It's going to take some time. They basically <laughs> stalled. And then uh, they ended up replacing that emergency, those emergency powers with this new specialised legislation, which was their pandemic powers, the pandemic legislation bill. Um, now, to 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 some some credit, they in the in the new bill, they do have to release the um, charter assessments and the medical advice. Now, whether it's good or not is another matter, but they do have to release that stuff now. So we are seeing that as of you know when that went in. I think it was February that it actually got enacted. So or that it actually came into effect. So. Um, you can go and read those charter assessments now. Um, the, the summary assessments and some of the medical advice as well, you can see. Okay, so they're slowly trickling it out. Is that right? Well, no, well, they do it every time they um, come up with a new direction. Um, they, okay. have to, they have to uh, show their workings to some degree now. Now, I, I'm not particularly impressed with uh, some of the justifications that they've got and, uh, you know, if they're similar to what was happening under the state of emergency, I probably wouldn't have been impressed with that either. But we've never seen any of that that's happened under the state of emergency. But presumably some of the justifications are very similar. Yeah. So um, out of fear of depressing the audience and keeping them stuck in 2020 to 2022, um, we'll move on. We're, I mean, we're going to always touch back to the pandemic sort of stuff. Um, but one of the things that I've been seeing pop up a lot recently coming out of Melbourne is the ambulance crisis. Um, and it's my understanding that there was a bit of a crisis before um, the pandemic and that it was never addressed, but I don't know. So what's going on over there with the ambulances? Yeah, it just seems like a really intractable problem. So we have massive demand for ambulances and uh, they can't keep up with it for you know, a whole range of reasons. I wouldn't want to say that I know the answer as to why this has happened. But oh, no, you definitely need to give me the answer, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I've got some views on some things that have definitely contributed to it. Um, so there was a... Throughout the pandemic, there was this sort of big ramping up of fear, right, about, about COVID and about other things. And what sort of happened during the pandemic is people were calling up for ambulances for all sorts of things that maybe they didn't really need to. So that was one contributing factor. And the government's made a big deal about that, you know, people calling up for an ambulance because, you know, they got a cough or something and um, yeah, yeah. they didn't really need to. So there's clearly some of that is going on, but also they lost uh, 
some staff. So some of the staff they lost through vaccine mandates. Uh, how many, we don't really know. Um, they've said it's a very small number, and I agree that it's a small number that was sacked. But through you know my uh, conversations with various people, many people resigned rather than wait until they got sacked because they didn't want yeah. to um, they didn't want to have a black mark on their resume basically. Mm. So a lot of people just resigned, and that's not just in um, uh, emergency services, but uh, throughout many many workers would rather just resign and take a break and hope to wait it out. I think is what lots of them were doing. Yeah, I think um, that's huge for teachers. Yeah, so um, the teacher mandates have been removed now as of Monday this week. Um, mm. Unvaccinated teachers can apply for a job. And interestingly, they're not allowed to ask for their status anymore and they're not mm. allowed to reveal it. Um, and I think that's a good thing that uh, we're sort of uh, denormalising this idea that it's okay to uh, press for personal, you know, private medical information from people when it's not particularly relevant to their job. You know, I accept that in some jobs, um, medical information is uh, necessary to understand in order to do the job. You know, you can't, you know, if you're a fireman, you have to be fit, right? And, you know, other other jobs, your, your um, personal medical information is relevant to the job. But uh, I think that they sort of normalise this idea that even when it's not relevant, you should be disclosing this if this information. I think getting back to the principles of privacy, um, that you shouldn't be, you know, normalizing that. I think is a, is a good thing that we need to get back to as soon as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I applied to be a fireman, they made sure that my fitness level was up to scratch, but not to save people from burning buildings. It was just for the calendar. Um, <laughs> let's hope they never have a politician's calendar <laughs> God, <help us> all. <laughs> yeah i mean that's it i mean there's staffing shortages everywhere um yeah which is I mean, huge... in general there's staffing shortages i mean you know like it's not just it's not just uh uh paramedics it's uh mm. every industry has staffing shortages for a range of, of reasons but um you know, another thing that's been that is unique in Victoria is we've had this um, uh, exodus. We've had a big decline in population. Yeah. I think you know over the last two years it was some somewhere in the order of a hundred. Our population declined by somewhere in the order of a hundred thousand people. Uh, some yeah. of those people <clears throat> went into state. Some of them left the country. Uh, and yeah, I mean that's presumably these people were you know. Uh, gainfully employed or something as well. And I don't know, maybe some paramedics left. I don't know, but um, well, it, it would, people been leaving. I, I, like if you had to guess, it would be people who were in skilled labor positions because to be able to afford to uproot and move, and most of them moved to, to Queensland as well. And they've got a massive rent crisis up there now because there's an oversupply of people looking for housing. Um, but it's yeah like it's only people who can afford to move who actually moved which is typically people in these high paid high skilled labor jobs so yeah i mean you're not going to be able to yeah unless you've got you know if you've got a job lined up in another state uh, typically you would you would think that you wouldn't just uh move states or move countries unless you had some sort of plan right to get an income uh, i've spoken yeah. to a lot of people as well who just they were immigrants and they just went back to their home country um, which I think is really sad. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I love Australia, and I, I want other people to love Australia. I don't want people to think Australia is an awful place and they want to leave. It's, um, but you know, I'm not not criticizing them for that. I can understand why they might want to um, go go home, but uh, especially when you know travel was so restrictive, uh, mm. many people um, miss their families, and and you know, it's not just a matter of. Uh, missing contact with a family you know you have uh big events like marriages and funerals and 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 life events and a lot of people in in melbourne uh you know have, they have family overseas you know i'm one of those people you know mm -hmm. my, my wife's from overseas and um, we missed out on all that stuff too and um you can sort of see that you know, if families want to be, you know, maintain, be close together and they can't travel, maybe they make that decision. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's very surreal looking back and 
being like, oh, that was actually the rules. You could only go to Woolworths for like an hour at a time by yourself, no family members. And oh. it's just, yeah. So as I said earlier, let's, um, <laughs> maybe we should limit the, the pandemic talk so that we don't depress people further. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're, on the, we're on the up curve now. So it's, 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 yeah. it's things that are getting better, I think. So that's I don't cool. want to flatten that mood curve, uh, any more than we have to. Um, so there's an election coming. You just came back into Parliament because you were going for a Senate seat, uh, missed out, and so now you're back in your original role. Uh, but mm. you also have an election coming up in November. So what can you tell us about uh, your chances? Um, I think they're pretty good. Uh, and tell mm. us what you guys are working on and what, what you hope to achieve. Yeah, so what happened... Uh, so. Yeah, I was uh, convinced by many people to make a run at the Senate. So this is the federal Senate. So in order to do that under Australian electoral law, federal electoral laws, you have to you can't be a member of parliament when you nominate to do that. So uh, I had to resign. So we made an arrangement within the party that, you know, I would resign, run for the Senate. If I was successful, then they would replace me in the state parliament because in the upper house you can do that. Um, mm -hmm. If we weren't successful, then they would reappoint me to where I was originally elected in the state parliament. So effectively, I was sort of uh, not a member of parliament for a few months from April until last week. Uh, and um, yeah, look, we've learned a lot. Like this is the biggest election campaign that we've ever run. Uh, as I said before, we've got lots of new members and supporters and volunteers. And uh, we thought it was a very good chance to, you know, um, gain a lot of experience for our volunteers and candidates um, for the, the really important election that's coming up in November. And, um, you know, like we've we've had learnings from that. So we've conducted a review. Um, we're going to publish that to our party members internally soon. But things like, you know, what are some of the things that we can improve on uh, that we could have done better? Um, what are some of the things that we did do well? Um, how, do, how do we, what sort of new processes do we need uh, and systems in place? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how we're uh, learning from that experience and, um, you know, managing things as a larger organisation now, which, you know, before, like at the last state election, it was like a tiny group of people, right? You know, mm. it would have been just a few dozen people involved in, in running everything. And now we've got, you know, thousands. Um, so obviously that's a lot more difficult to organise and a lot of people are learning how to manage that and uh yeah so i mean in the end look we our overall vote wasn't as high as i was hoping for but it was still fairly solid you know we missed out on the last position by i think it was like 1.6 percent or something mm -hmm. um, and it ended up going to uap candidate um congratulations to him um but at the same time that support that we've got i'm pretty sure it's like rock solid um so, you know, we, we need to build on that for the state election. Now, in the state election, I think we've got really good chances of both um, getting Tim and I re-elected and potentially getting someone else elected due to the, um, you know, the, the voting system in Victoria is quite different to federal, which it won't go into all the details, but effectively it makes it easier or, or more likely that smaller parties can get a crack in the upper house particularly the way that the, the system works in Victoria. And, um, you know, we think that we should be able to do pretty well in November and we're working on that already. So um, we've been putting together, you know, our branches and our systems in place and our campaign committee, and we're gearing up for that like straight away. Yeah. And you, you just mentioned Tim and Tim was the only person who, who voted against having a blanket ban on the swastika uh yeah melbourne which is is like it sounds like you're being a nazi sympathizer or something but it's actually crazy to ban uh because it, it's just a basically the way i see it is banning the swast sticker is like taking alex jones off youtube because as soon as that happened most people can agree yeah it's an evil it's bad yeah we agree yeah get rid of it but then what was it two months later youtube then took down like a hundred conservative commentators and then another hundred and then it was just a big snowball so i don't know what symbols next but um i know yeah. the removalist for anyone who uh 
Yeah, I wasn't able to vote on that because like the day that that happened was last Tuesday. I actually wasn't a member of parliament, so I couldn't vote, mm -hmm. but I would have voted against it as well. And you're right, like the what we're really doing is setting the precedent of banning symbols, right? And uh, I think that's a really dangerous precedent. And, you know, even in the debate in parliament, they were talking about, yeah, you know, we're going to have to review this and see which symbols are next. Uh, a lot of these extremist groups don't even use that symbol. Um, mm. So you know, it just seems a bit, it's a bit of signaling, I suppose. And people were too scared to take a principled stand against it in many ways. You know, I do, I do acknowledge though that, you know, it's a, it's a distressing symbol and, um, you know, lots of people find it highly offensive, but, um, I think what's more offensive is the idea of uh, setting a precedent of uh, censoring symbols, because I think that's a really dangerous precedent. We haven't had that before and uh, it started now and God knows where it will end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, maybe they could have got me on, on board if they uh, were banning the QR code, because I find that. <laughs> <laughs> well, QR codes were quite innocuous before they started using them for checking. Right? Them like they were quite useful things, you know. I, I, yeah. I remember being at a event and um, we we're just talking about marketing and I was like, oh, why don't we put QR codes on, on the card so that they can get straight to it? And everyone was like, no one uses QR codes anymore. This yeah, is like they got a bad vibe. Like, yeah, yeah, like, I mean, I remember before the pandemic, I was tossing up whether to put a QR code on my business card, right? Because you can scan it and get, you know, get, get a link to your social media and stuff and it's really convenient. Yeah. But like... I don't know. They've got a bad vibe about them now. So I don't think people really like using them anymore. I'm just seeing if I have a copy of my business card. I don't. Oh, well, I have a QR code on the back that says, as soon as you scan this, all your data goes to the CCP. <laughs> and then, you know, if you want to, you can. And if you don't, you can just type in the website. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just to, to take a step back, I guess, um, because you said you took this stance on principle. Um, so a lot of people don't actually, and that's the easy thing about the LDP as a party is that their policies haven't really changed in however long they've been uh, around for um, because they're all based on these certain libertarian principles, right? Um, mm. So for people who have been following you just because you're the voice of freedom during the pandemic and now they've stuck with you what can you tell them about what you are as a libertarian and what that actually means as a philosophy or what would you say it's a way of life is it a political philosophy what what is it really i think what we're looking at like from a philosophical point of view i, I see it as a moral philosophy right and um what people when people became interested in the party and in what we were doing. That was because of one particular issue. And, uh, you know, basically around the pandemic response re most recently, right? And they saw us fighting against that. But what um, we've been having to do is, you know, bring people on the journey and understand the, the reasoning why we opposed it and that it's not just something that we, you know, pulled out of thin air. This is like fundamental to our our beliefs right so you know fundamentally we believe that you know um, individuals have rights uh and chief among those is you know the, or the right that everyone has is property rights and the first property that everyone owns is their own body and then they can um interact with other people and if those interactions are, are voluntary and free from coercion then we see that as a just interaction and if coercion is involved then we see that as unjust and um, what was happening is the government was increasing and ramping up the coercion and forcing people to, uh, you know, uh, drop interactions with other people or, you know, they were taking away the, their liberty to move, their liberty to work, um, their right to associate with other people, uh, right of peaceful assembly. Uh, all of these sorts of things were taken away from people. And uh, we felt like we had no choice but to push back against that um, you know even libertarians acknowledge that um you know rights have uh some sort of limitations in in certain circumstances but uh you know if the government is going to limit people's rights they bloody well better um have good justification for it and we didn't feel it was there at all uh and, and um 
yeah, so we, we felt that uh, much of it was totally unjustified. Yeah, I, I did a post um, at the start of the pandemic. Um, and again, we keep coming back to the pandemic. I'm sorry to the audience yeah, yeah. for depressing you. But um, <laughs> uh, about how if we allow this forced lockdown to take place, we're basically saying that the government are the ruling class and they're basically our parents. Um, and I don't think the majority of, of Australians before all of this craziness would go to an election day and be like, I'm going to vote on who gets to decide who, uh, who, who gets to decide if I go outside or not, or if I run my business or not, or how far I can travel, or what family members I can like. That was that wasn't even in our way of thinking. It was just like, oh no. yeah, we'll just vote for some clown. But now it's kind well, of many like... people were shocked that the government had that much power to do that. I mean, you know, I was shocked as well. Really, I mean, you know, we knew that emergency powers existed, uh, but. Yeah, you have to question, um, you know, this thing was this sort of tool was sitting there in the in the government's back pocket and they used it. Right. Um, and interestingly, a lot of these restrictions in the, that were in the original um, health uh, health legislation were brought about because of um, biosecurity things. But there was like cases where historically there was a person that was um, many years ago, deliberately infecting people with HIV. And they had no laws to, to stop that person doing that. And so they had these laws drafted and this was part of that. And um, I don't think anyone envisaged that it would be used for such wildly different purposes. And this is something that libertarians talk about all the time and probably is pertinent to this Nazi bill thing as well with the <laughs> banning the swastika is uh, laws, uh, when you think about the the consequences of laws, you don't just think about the consequences of the laws that they're using for the particular case that they're bringing them in for. You have to think about all of the other ways that those laws can be used and who's going to be using those laws in the future because you're not just giving the laws and the powers to the current government, however much you may like or dislike them, you're giving them to every future government as well. And so it's... it's um, you yeah. have to be really mindful of that. And, you know, with the precedent of banning symbols, right? Like, let's say that you totally support the current government and you think this is a wonderful thing that they're doing. You still have to imagine a future government that you don't like uh, is going to have that same power and they're going to have that same precedent and they're going to be able to make the same arguments to ban other symbols that um, they don't like. And I think that's really alarming. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it was... Um that kind of line of reasoning all kind of uh reminded me of economics in one lesson where it boils down mm. to that one sentence which is you know the the i'm gonna butch the quote butch botch i'm gonna botch the butched quote um where it's you know the the art of economics isn't looking at you know cause and effect of one policy and one outcome it's looking at all of the outcomes of this policy, foreseen and unforeseen, right? Um, yeah. People can just look up economics in one lesson and get the quote and put it in the comments. Maybe that will be better. Definitely worth um, reading for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So libertarianism, as you put it, is uh, private property rights. And if you don't own the most fundamental thing, which is your body, then you don't really own anything. Um, so... Is that where you're stemming from? Is that what you're all about? Yeah, well, I mean, it sort of goes back to John Stuart Mill. I think, he, didn't he say, um, over over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign, right? And, you know, we, we believe that, that people should be able to own their own bodies and um, do uh, things with their own bodies. And if they interact with other people, whether it be through, you know, friendships, employment, uh, or, you know, relationships or, you know, even talking to each other like we're doing now, if those are voluntary and consensual interactions, then we, we see that as just and fine and there should be no, uh, the government shouldn't be interfering in that. The government should stay out of it. The only, only justification for the government to interfere in things is where coercion is involved and then there is, there is a justification for uh, the government to interfere in that case. So how small, so libertarians always say, oh, we've got to shrink the government. We've got to shrink it down to a size that you can drown it in the bathtub, which is hypothetical. But how small do you think the government needs to be to be able to function? And so um, 
I mean, libertarians are divided on this, but the basic idea yeah. of a libertarian would be you need to know the rules of the game before you can play. If there are no rules, then, and I actually disagree with that, but let's just go with that. So how small does the government have to be to be able to have some common sense rules where it kind of protects the rights of the individual versus what it is now, which is basically in control of everything? Yeah, look, I... Uh I don't like thinking, I, I know lots of uh, libertarians like um, having these hypothetical end states. I actually I actually don't like that at all. Uh, I like to see it as a direction and a trajectory, right? And um, at the moment, we're going well in the wrong trajectory. So we're, <laughs> we're desperately trying to just tilt it back. But, yeah. you know, if, if there are people there that think the government should have um, less scope and control over people's lives than what they do now, then I think we're on the same bus, right? And, you know, let's head in the same direction together. Maybe we want to get off the bus at different points. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's about the trajectory. And, you know, look, I, I, I personally think that, um, you know, there's some fundamental things that uh, I think are justified actions by, by the state. You know, things like um, uh, the government, like if there's issues around uh, force, fraud, uh, contract enforcement, um, these sorts of things, I think that's a clear case for the government uh, preventing. As like an that. arbitration sort of agency. Yeah, but yeah, or, or the police to stop, you know, theft and, and uh, uh, harm to other people, you know, through crimes. Um, I also, you know, maybe some libertarians disagree with me on this, but, you know, I think I, I sort of... Um, I adhere to the uh, the classical liberal sort of Hayekian view that you know there is some scope for um, uh, basic uh, welfare and these sorts of things to you know to ensure that uh, you know we don't have people on the on the streets and stuff like that. So I, I, I do think that there should be some sort of basic frameworks for welfare and things like this, um, and you know defence of the state as well. Um, I think is a totally legitimate thing, and. But again, like, you know, I don't like dealing in terms of some sort of utopian end state or end game because we're so far away from that that it's sort of irrelevant. I'd rather talk about, you know, what we're going to do to um, reduce the coercion as much as we can and increase the voluntary cooperation and interactions with people to the maximum degree possible within the current framework that we have. David Limbrick, the statist, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> communist statist. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just geeing you up. Um, Eddie's asking if you think Matt from the Liberal Party will repeal the pandemic legislation if elected. They've or committed it. to it, so um, I'd have to, you know, I take him at his word. If he says he'll get rid of it, he'll get rid of it, I suppose. But we'll have to wait and see. I think getting getting elected is the biggest hurdle there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's crazy how much support the Andrews government has. Um, like I see on Facebook, people giving him virtual hugs and creating these support groups. Where it's, let, let's, let's not dwell. Um, I would say one more thing about libertarians in general and the LDP, if you want to kind of um, conceptualize it in your mind, is that each party on the left and the right, they all have their own value sets, but what they have in common is that they want to force that upon the population. So I was watching the Young Turks the other day, and I forget the lady's name of the Young Turks, the one that's always riled up about things, and she was screaming about um, how you shouldn't bring, bring Christianity into a political debate. And it's like, well, this is their value set, and the system that you're supporting and that you want you want to put your value set on other people as well. It doesn't matter where those values come from, if it comes from religion or if it comes from science, whatever it is, you're advocating putting your value set on people who just want to live their lives. Whereas a libertarian, if elected into any position, is saying, no, no, we don't want you to live a Christian life or a Hindu life or a, a life of any, anything that we think is valuable. We want you to choose for yourself and we want to make it fair for everyone and make sure no one's exploited um, or, or fraudulent or things like that or breaking contracts. And so I think that's a major difference between most two-party systems in the world will have this kind of paradigm, well, in the Western world, whereas every libertarian party in the world are saying, hey, we just want to roll back the state and let you live your life. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I don't, I don't see how people can 
be upset about that. But, I mean, here we are. Yeah, I mean, many people, like in, in Victoria, we've, you know, we've had this sort of left-wing government and people see, you know, well, maybe the opposite of that is to have a conservative government from the Liberal Party or something. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I see in many ways conservatives uh, just want to, enforce different values you know, use yeah. the state to push different values on society and that, that's a big difference between us and conservatives and the left is that we're not really trying to push values on on people other than uh where it's where we think it's appropriate for the state to use force fundamentally that's what it comes down to and you know the appropriate use of force is to prevent coercion uh really um, you know if you want to simplify it as much as possible but we're not mm. saying, you know, people should live according to a particular religion or should do various things with their own bodies. We're just saying that they should be able to make those decisions themselves as long as they're not hurting other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, which brings us to vaping. Um, Brian Marlowe and I from Legalize Vaping did a little live stream on Facebook. You can watch at Legalize Vaping's Facebook page um where we watched the four corners episode. did you end up watching that episode of four corners i haven't watched it yet i haven't watched it yet yeah everyone well, you can, you can just it. watch our live stream you get everything you need to know yeah. <laughs> um but it was a ridiculous hit piece um about how vaping hooks children and it's a gateway drug and uh this and that and the other so you guys want to legalize va vaping i presume but Tell me, what are you guys doing and, and what's your stance on on vaping? And I think in particular, nicotine vaping. Yeah, yeah. So I've spoken about vaping many times since being in Parliament. We actually um, have put forward amendments and motions and things on various legislation around vaping. So we support um, people being able to choose to vape uh, if they want, as long as they're adults. So we don't support children um, having access to nicotine vapes because we don't feel that they're able to properly form consent and make that decision yet. But um, I think it's like a massive public health issue and it really highlights the hypocrisy of much of the public health establishment in that they were going on and on and on about COVID and, um, you know, we need to, you know, totally shut down society because some people are going to die from COVID. And yet we have uh, something such as, as horrible as uh, tobacco where, um, you know, 20,000 Australians die a year from tobacco related disease there is an alternative out there um, that is vaping that many people have chosen to give up cigarettes. And, you know, it's not perfect. Um, vaping's not perfect. There's still some unknowns. But again, you know, this comes down to ownership of your own body. If someone wants to make a choice to vape instead of smoke uh, to reduce the harm on their body and probably save some money as well, then absolutely they should be able to do it. And I think a lot of these problems that they're talking about with, you know, kids getting access to it and stuff is really brought about by the fact that there's this massive grey and black market and they don't care about selling to kids. Like they just, you mm. know, if it was a if it was a properly, properly functioning and regulated market, then you wouldn't uh, have many of these sort of issues, I suppose. And, um, yeah. you know, the idea that it's a, a gateway drug and this sort of thing, well... It's a, it's a it's an exit strategy for many people from a terrible drug, which is tobacco, uh, that causes much harm to people. For many people, it's a way of them exiting that drug. So, you know, this idea that it's it <coughs> bring bring awful uh, consequences on society, I think, is is totally wrong. It's clearly a harm minimization tool that many people find highly effective. Yeah, definitely, and I think. Uh... John Ilianidis from Stanford, when he was doing one of his presentations um, on the effects of some of the government policies around the world and, and the disease itself, mm. had a hypothetical saying if governments just banned smoking and if they were able to because black markets will, of course, pop up, but if they banned smoking, this is how many lives it would save. And it was millions upon millions. And he goes, but that's not what you should do. That's not how society should function. Like everyone should have a choice. But... I mean, if there's this safe alternative, I mean, nothing's safer than just breathing oxygen, but mm. I mean, compared to smoking a cigarette with the thousands of chemicals that are in it. In my documentary, um, we did a little segment on vaping and I listed all of the chemicals in one cigarette and it just scrolls the screen mm. and you can't even read it. It's just so much mm. um, compared to 
smoking vapor with a little bit of flavor and it's just it's really a no-brainer and the funniest thing about the four corners episode if you end up watching it is that greg greg hunt gets on and he says yeah you know what i'm just committed to this issue and to to uh, criminalizing vaping and in the same sentence he says i don't meet with uh vaping lobbies uh anti-vaping lobbies Uh, i don't meet with vaping and he says he doesn't meet with anyone on either side he's just kind of made up his mind beforehand and said yep on a hunch this is what i'm gonna do it's really it's a real prohibitionist mindset i mean these people are prohibitionists Mm -hmm. basically you know they want to they don't want vaping i think another thing here is vaping is sort of embarrassing to a lot of these people who've been campaigning against tobacco because they've been campaigning you know to get people to stop smoking for forever right and then yeah all of a sudden the the market provides this alternative which is wildly successful and <laughs> helps lots of people give up smoking uh almost instantly uh you know i, I I've, I've lost count of the number of people that i've met that just gave up smoking just like that you know they they mm. put down a packet of smokes they started vaping and that was fine like it it, it was enough to um stop them smoking almost instantaneously and you know that's sort of embarrassing to a lot of these people i think as well yeah definitely a no-brainer i think but i mean politicians are no-brainers but not in the positive sense <laughs> hey what are you trying to say <laughs> except for you except for you my friend except for you. <laughs> actually how was it in your break between running for senate and becoming back into parliament did you feel like a different person or- i was interesting being like just an unemployed citizen uh yeah i had a little bit of a rest I think my wife got sick of me after a while, so she's probably <laughs> she's probably happy that I'm back at work now. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just took a few weeks to recuperate because uh, it was yeah it takes a lot of energy doing a campaign like that, and um, yeah, we didn't actually know the results for like three or four weeks. It takes it takes a long time to tabulate everything. And, it takes yeah. a long time for them to rub out who people voted for. And oh, <laughs> we didn't well we, we why do they in, use pencil yeah. i don't know why are they using pencil well they, they they say because they can store them between elections uh pens don't last that long whereas pencils last forever oh. so that's basically oh, it. and they're cheaper they're cheaper that's but like we we went through we uh sent in scrutinies and stuff and we were looking at the whole process very closely i don't have any concerns with the integrity no, me, of, i was just joking yeah um, i know a lot of people i, I just want to make that clear because a lot of people out there yeah. were talking about you know there's corruption in the in the system and stuff and look there might be small scale stuff happening but i certainly didn't see any sort of systemic integrity mm-hmm. problems and i i thought that the aec generally do a a, a really uh, top quality job you know it takes a long time i wish it was quicker but um I think it's a very thorough process and I didn't have any concerns and no one raised any concerns with me from our team. Yeah, I think part of the perceived problem is that people see these protests and they see thousands upon thousands of people in the free freedom movement and then they don't realise that all of these people are from different electorates. So it's not like a wave of people that can just go to one seat and get someone elected in that seat. They're all spread out. So... Mm. Yes, it's a lot of people, but it's spread out amongst all these different seats. So it's, you know. Yeah, I mean, for the Senate, though, like it's the state, it's statewide, right? But there was. Yeah, true, was, true. Yeah. There was the complication that, you know, a lot of these people that were, uh, you know, protesting were, they were, they were fragmented amongst a bunch of different parties and sort of that, yeah. that, uh, that caused problems as well so yeah yeah and the pref the, the they don't really understand well I, I don't want to say they don't understand it but the preferential voting system i think is great um yeah but uh yeah anyway that's another story um so something that's less um easy to accept than vaping is uh cannabis so mm. uh as libertarians we say what you do with your body it's a victimless crime uh, you should be able to do that. Um, yep. It's crazy that people can get thrown in jail with rapists and murderers for smoking a plant and they're just altering their state. So uh, what's your stance on marijuana legislation and uh, going forward? Yeah, so, I mean, our party policy is uh, full legalisation of cannabis with the exception of uh, shouldn't be sold to children. Uh, 
so yeah we would like to see an, a, a market for this like clearly prohibition has failed right um you can get um you know cannabis is we've got one of the highest consumption rates of cannabis in the world in in australia right and it's a prohibited product but still it exists because people want it now I, I just think i've always thought it's silly that we're you know criminalizing a plant like this uh especially when you look at the harms compared with you know, other drugs like tobacco, for example, which has terrible harm or alcohol or you know, heroin or any of these other legal or illegal drugs. Um, cannabis has quite a low harm threshold. So, yeah, we, we've always supported uh, legalization of cannabis. Um, there was something that's changed since last time I, I spoke with you. There was an inquiry into uh, cannabis in Victoria by the Legal and Social Issues Committee in Victorian Parliament. Now, um, I was I, I wrote a dissenting report on that. I was part of the committee. Uh, I was very uh, disappointed with what came out of that. Um, the government clearly doesn't see an appetite for legalising cannabis, even though, to their credit, they did in the last term of Parliament um, legalise medicinal cannabis, which is um, quite difficult for people to access and stuff like that. But it has helped some people, especially with diseases like um, uh, epilepsy. It's it's useful for certain pain medication, uh, for pain relief in certain certain instances. Mm. Um, uh, multiple sclerosis as well. Uh, some people use it for relief. So they, they have, to their credit, they did legalise it for those purposes and that's sort of growing. But um, yeah, we still have a situation where it's, uh, yeah, it's criminal to grow it and sell it. Uh, I would have thought that that would be changing. You know, we've had changes in ACT recently. They legalised um, possession and use and also legalised people to grow it, uh, you know, for personal use. They didn't legalise product like commercial production or anything, but it was a small step to stop people, you know, as you say, getting getting uh, mixed up with law enforcement and the court system because they smoke a plant that the government doesn't like. Um, mm. I would like to see it at least do that uh, because, I mean, as you say, it, it, apart from anything, it's just an incredible waste of money. Uh, you know, <laughs> mm. like it's really expensive to police and send through the court system and the criminal system. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite certain that that will be um, one of the policies that will be talking about in the lead up to the state election. Um, we think that um, it's crazy that it's still prohibited. Uh, we should allow that uh, market to develop and take it away from organised crime. This is another thing in Victoria. We've got a long history of problems with organised crime, right? And the reason that most of this organised crime exists is around drugs and black because of prohibition. It's a, it's a byproduct of prohibition. And anyone that's followed the history in Victoria would know about, you know, all these criminal gangs. They fight each other. They kill each other. We've had, you know, gang wars for, for years now. And really, it's drug prohibition that's driving nearly all of that. Um, they're fighting for turf, you know, and anyone that knows about how markets work, if you have a black market, you don't have a peaceful mechanism to resolve disputes. And so they resort to violence, whereas in a, in a legal market, disputes can be resolved by courts, by you know, ombudsmans and all these other mechanisms that are peaceful mechanisms. But of course, black markets don't have those peaceful mechanisms and it results in violence. Yeah, that's why I, I find it so difficult to watch shows like Breaking Bad where you're watching it and you're like, hey, if this was legal, none of this would be happening because it's just it's just gang lords fighting each other over turf over distribution, over these massive amounts of money because mm. there's only a few distributors because it's so dangerous. And it's just, I, I can't even watch those shows as much as people say, oh, this is amazing. It's like, oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in my maiden speech, I actually brought this up and I, I made the comparison at the time to uh, alcohol prohibition in the 1920s in the US. Mm. And all of the problems that you see happened and were created through alcohol prohibition are basically the same problems as we've got right now with um the way that we way that we manage drugs as a criminal issue rather than as, as a as a health issue which is I, I think is the way it should be dealt with um you know a, a health and a personal responsibility issue you know I, i'd much rather see instead of you know police courts 
and prisons managing this. I'd rather see, you know, families, health professionals and, and community groups manage these sort of problems that people have. You know, no one's denying that drugs cause harm, by the way, right? Drugs absolutely yeah. cause harm, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the real question is whether prohibition is making that harm worse or not. And I firmly believe that prohibition is making that harm a lot worse, uh, especially in the case of drugs that have um, very uh, low harm profile in the first place, such as cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to question whether we're doing the right thing or not with this. So, but yeah, I mean, alcohol prohibition in the 20s, they had proliferation of organized crime. They had uh, adulterated substances, which killed people because they weren't regulated by markets like they normally would be. So you get, you know, dodgy, dodgy moonshine that would end up sending yeah. people blind or killing them. Um, you would get uh, exorbitantly high prices. You would get uh, smuggling operations, illegal production operations, all the stuff that goes along with organized crime and the violence that goes with it. You know, people are getting shot in the streets. But the other interesting thing, and this, this is what um, many people miss, is that the biggest opponents of getting rid of prohibition were organized crime, right? They yeah. want they want prohibition. Prohibition's good for their business. And they're, you know, getting rid of prohibition puts them out of business. So they're the last people that uh, want prohibition to go away because it keeps prices up, it, it protects their market. Uh, so yeah, so we're not gonna get, uh, not gonna get organized crime uh, voting for the Liberal Democrats probably. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's um... There was a video I watched a few years ago of a hitman's confessions and he's got like a balaclava over his face and it's in the United States and he's from New York or one of those areas. And he basically says to the TV host, everything that I've done is only because it's illegal. And if it was mm. legal, I wouldn't exist. Mm. Like, like what makes an addict? Like you guys make it. And he just explains everything to a T why organized crime exists. And it's in their best interest, like you said, to keep it illegal because or else they'll take a massive pay cut. Um, mm. I remember I got a phone call one time um, when there was talks about, I think they had just legalized um, medicinal marijuana in Victoria. And I got a call from someone and he's like, hey, mate, I need a video because I do video production. He goes, hey, mate, I need a video. I was like, okay. Um, what, what do you mean? What type of, and he didn't say his name or anything. He goes, I just need a video. I'm like, all right. And um, he basically sounded like he was a drug dealer. And then he told me that he had a um, hydroponics farm in Victoria. And this was like the day that it became legal. So he had had already had his setup that he was supplying in the black market. And he called me and he was like, yeah, I want to le legitimize my business, put a nice video on my website. And he was already on the front foot to go legal with his operation. It was so funny. It was such a funny conversation. Um, but yeah, so what can we expect uh, if you're re-elected? You're going to be pushing uh, legalization of cannabis, of nicotine vaping. Is there anything else on your radar before we uh, call it a day? Oh, look, I think um, some of the things that we've been talking about as well, we need to look at um, emergency powers and how they're how they're used and what exists because I'm concerned about the next emergency and what's going to happen there. So I think we definitely need to be looking at that as well. I want to look at, um, you know, preferably some sort of Royal Commission into the pandemic response. I think we need to look at what happened and, and learn from it. But as well, I think we'll be talking about uh, a lot about economic recovery because inflation and debt are really big issues at the moment. And we need to talk about all right, how can we lower the cost of living? So lower taxes, how can we um, make sure that, you know, we've got enough people to, to work and, and do all these jobs and, and get, get back towards a, a prosperous uh, state? Because, you know, we're in such serious debt at the moment and the government really needs to look at how we're going to manage that over the longer term. You know, with interest rates very, very low and bond rates very, very low, it wasn't such a big deal. But with inflation going up, that's not going to stay like that forever. And uh, I'm really concerned that we could end up in big trouble. And all of these programs that, you know, all the left love throwing money around, well, you need a prosperous economy to fund that stuff. You can't just keep going into debt forever. Uh, yeah. 
And yeah, we've got to think about how we're going to manage that. So I think economics and economic recovery is going to be a big deal, as it was in the federal election. I think by the time we get to November, we might even be in a darker place economically because it's there's some pretty dark clouds on the horizon. Someone's asking if you could look into the digital ID laws. I mean, they're just ramping up every every time I look at the newspaper, there's something else. I think in Victoria yeah. where you've got a new a new health register, do you not? Um yeah, so the digital ID thing, that's federal. Um, and yeah, I am concerned about that. But the there was a new um, health bill, which we were, we were opposing, uh, which effectively sh shares health information amongst providers. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we were concerned because there was no mechanism to opt out of it. And so I've got privacy concerns about that. Um, if, it, if, if you could opt into it, maybe it makes sense you know you can choose whether you want to have that centralized because i can see some of the benefits as well it's convenient to have that all in one place but certainly it should be a choice again right you shouldn't be forced into it especially with very personal medical information so yeah we, we were strongly opposing that uh yeah has anyone had some yeah, no. my biggest my biggest concern is really before we get to that point is they're going to have to develop this huge it system and i don't know if you follow like how we do IT project, government IT projects in Victoria, but they don't have a very good track record at all. <laughs> so um, just, a little luck, it'll never get built, but anyway. <laughs> that'll be built by 2050. Yeah, yeah. With copper white. Um, so if anyone has questions um, in the comment section, now is your time to, to post them quickly. Maybe we'll just linger for another five minutes. And um, if anyone has some pressing questions, I'm just trying to scroll up here. Um, Let's have a look at a uh, problem with cannabis uh, is that it can be detected long after any intoxicating yeah. events have gone. Yeah. 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 We've, I've spoken about this many, many times. I think that the current um, drug driving, you know, drug testing, roadside drug testing regime is, uh, is really unjust. Unlike uh, roadside breathalyzer testing where you know there is a very good relationship between impairment and the amount of alcohol in your in your blood and in your breath mm -hmm. um with the testing that they do for cannabis that's not the case at all and um you know i don't want people that are impaired by drugs or alcohol being driving on the roads the problem is that the tests that they're using now to test for cannabis do not test impairment that's a huge problem uh, and i feel like lots of people are you know losing their license and getting uh, offenses when in reality, there haven't been a danger to anyone because they weren't actually impaired. They might have had a joint or something, you know, the day before or a couple of days before. They're not actually impaired by drugs and yet they're still getting pinged. I think we definitely need to move to testing for impairment for everything rather than testing whether drugs are in your system. It's a big problem. I think it undermines the roadside, the whole testing regime, because I think it is important that, you know, people aren't impaired by drugs or alcohol on the roads. But if people don't have faith in that system because they don't think it's actually testing for impairment, I think it undermines the entire system. I think they should just give them a kaleidoscope when they pull them over. And if they enjoy it too much, then obviously they shouldn't be driving. Um, are the Lib Dems going to do anything about the facial recognition tech being used in retail stores, police stations, Melbourne City and other places? Yeah, so we've... Um, We've been looking at what's going on here. So I think the biggest problem is that uh, it wasn't clear to people when they entered these stores what was actually happening, right? And now that um, uh, people have become aware of it, I think some of the stores have actually backed down and stopped using it. Um, but I think, you know, stores, you know, again, this is down to property rights. Stores have a right to, you know, monitor things within their store, but also they have an obligation to, you know, you're forming a contract when you enter someone's store. Yeah. Now, there might be some implied contracts, you know, you're not going to steal their stuff and break things. But, you know, some of them have conditions of entry, right? You know, some say, you know, if you're going to enter this store, then, you know, you have to consent to having your bag opened on your way out, right, yeah. to make sure that they're not pinching stuff. If they're going to use this sort of technology, they've got to make it very clear to their customers that they're doing it and what the consequences are for people's privacy. And if people don't like it, they shouldn't go to those stores. Um, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's you know, using that sort of technology, which is quite invasive, 
without informing customers, I think it's quite deceptive and they shouldn't be doing that yeah. at all. Yep, 100%. Uh, in an environment where the powerful left leaning media and big tech play such a critical role in elections how can we win uh, i don't think eddie knows that we have our murdoch media and murdoch media uh, wins elections that was my kevin rudd impersonation no but he is right so the left to control the media pretty much we could we could they're definitely left leaning so with that kind of monster and especially i don't know if you ask people from the left they won't agree with you they'll say it's well, all right yeah, they'll say it's murdoch media murdoch media control well no they, they criticize they criticize the age as well and channel nine and 3aw like I, I don't know i don't think anyone would say that 3aw is a left-leaning media um What's three? is that a radio station in yeah, it's a three no. it's a radio station okay. so um yeah. look uh here's the thing right uh Media is more diverse now than it's ever been, I think. This idea that, uh, you know, a couple of media corporations can control the narrative on everything, I think that's just a, a, a boogeyman fantasy. It's not It's not the reality. I mean, social media is absolutely huge, right? Like what we're doing now is media as well, and no one's stopping us talking about things. Well, um, he did bring big tech into his question. I think he's... he's saying that big tech are also silicon valley is left leaning and yeah. their algorithms are against people like you so how do you well i don't know like i mean it? i haven't really i haven't had any problems with you know getting shadow banned or um you know i've got very large social media profile on a number of platforms and get high engagement that sort of thing so i haven't had a problem you know i know lots of people have had problems uh, with that, I, I think a lot of the stuff with the with the big tech, though, a lot of it is they're preempting government regulation. So governments, you know, shake their fist and say, you know, we're going to regulate the crap out of you, and um, they sort of freak out and try and preempt it and deal with it. And um, I think if government made a clear commitment, and this again, this is a federal issue, but I think if the federal government made a clear commitment and said, look, we're not going to um, tell you know, we're not going to tell big tech what they can and can't censor, except in the case of where it's, you know, criminal things and things like that. Um, we're going to step back and not regulate that. And some countries have done that sort of thing. I think these big tech companies would calm down a bit and be like, okay, well, you know, we don't have to worry about the government coming and stamping us because they're making threats all the time. The, the last government was making threats about, you know, trying to think we're going to regulate Facebook and we're going to do all this sort of stuff. And other, I know America's been talking about that as well. And these companies react. And we saw the same thing with um, a similar thing with um, plastic bag bans, right? Um, the the supermarkets started doing it themselves because uh, the governments were threatening to do it, right? So they just said, well, we'll just get ahead of the government and we'll just do our own thing. And I think that sort of same thing is happening with censorship. Gov the, the big tech companies are saying, well, um, government's threatening us, so we'll just get ahead of them. And then when they come for us, we'll say, well, you know, we're already doing what you're asking, right? So, yeah, I, I think that government needs to get out of it. Yeah, I definitely think government needs to get out of it, especially because Facebook, Twitter, and, and these massive giants can afford the compliance cost of these regulations. But if you want to start your own network, it's just impossible. We, we recently got nuked off um, Discord. So Discord right. is like a server for gaming, predominantly yeah. for gamers. And, stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah. they, they updated their terms of service saying that you can't say anything that's against mainstream science. And we said, hey, we're going to take our chances. And uh, we, we, we all got kicked off. So we're on Gilded now. And if anyone wants to join on Gilded, you have to go through um, the subscribe star link down the bottom. There's a free tier if you join there, if you're poor. That's fine. You can jump into our server. Um, maybe one or two, maybe, maybe let's say two more questions. Secession, when is it happen, happening? Um, Tim was pushing for a new state, was he not, at the top of uh, top of Yeah, Victoria. yeah. So he's, he's been, um, his project has been uh, Rexit, regional exit. Uh, the idea that, um, it, you know, when Federation happened, uh, there was always this sort of view that there would be more states, right? And it's set, the Constitution has the capacity for setting up new states. Uh, I think the only time in recent memory where we've come close is Northern Territory had a vote to become a state and they didn't. But there's nothing stopping uh, 
stopping us constitutionally from forming new states. And mm. the argument that Tim and many others have been making is that um, southern New South Wales and northern Victoria have a lot more in common with each other, you know, being, uh, you know, that Riverina sort of area around the Murray, they have a lot more in common with each other than they do with the major cities of Melbourne and Sydney. So why shouldn't they form their own state and become and, you know, take control of their own destiny? And the Constitution allows for that. And um, many people in those areas, are, you know, thinking, discussing that idea, and Tim's been promoting the idea, you know, have a new state and you know, it's, it's sort of interesting. They've been having meetings and stuff and people, you know, have arguments about where you should draw the line and um, what the new name of the new state should be. And, you know, I think some people have said it should be called the state of Murray or Riverina or whatever. And uh, one of the biggest complaints I've heard about it is um, when the people, you know, draw a sort of draft line of where they think the lines of this new state should be. There'll be people from communities outside the lines that say, no, no, we want to be part of that new stuff as well. <laughs> so why'd you leave us out? We, we don't want to be stuck with Melbourne anymore. But, I mean, there is a feeling in many regional areas that they're sort of being governed from the city. And, you know, that very much is the case in many ways. So um, why not take more control of their own destiny? So, you know, I think it's a really interesting long-term project. Yeah, I think so. And I like... Um... I think the first time I heard about this sort of stuff, it wasn't free the Free State Project. It was Project Free Cities, I think it was. A German guy was was doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Not uh, more charter cities rather than a right, new state yeah. in a country. But um, I love I think the there's idea. There's a movement in Northern Queensland as well wants to do something similar. So yeah, um, yeah, because they, they've got that. But I think West Australia went many years ago. They uh, they actually wanted to secede and become a new country uh but that never happened but um yeah they would never allow that there's too much mining revenue and yeah. i think one of the hurdles is probably you know the price of water from the murray river um that's my uneducated guess uh but mm. it was really good to talk to you um mm. thanks for taking the time and uh and supporting smaller channels and keep doing what you're doing um Everyone's very excited to see what you guys are, uh, what uh, based speeches you guys uh, <laughs> do over the next couple of years. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for inviting me along. It's great. You're to welcome. Uh, and everyone, if you want to join our Discord server, oh, Discord's gone now. Sorry, guys. Uh, but if you want to join our Gilded server, like I said, there's a little link in the in the description below. You can join our subscribe star. There's a free tier. And then just shoot me a message on there and I'll send you a link. Uh, and anything goes in there uh, except cool. the obvious things that are banned. Um, but really good talking with you and uh, we'll catch up with you in another two years. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully <laughs> sooner. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>